Good evening, and uh, glad to be here as a guest of Club Virtual. I'm Michael Ettinger from Ettinger Law Firm, and tonight we're going to talk about the five steps to an elder law estate plan, and I'll be sharing my screen with you. Uh, before we get there, just a little bit about um, myself and the firm. I've been a lawyer since 1980, so um, you can do the arithmetic. It's 2020, it's 40 years. Most of the time, the last 30 years, it's been just elder law estate planning. And in that time, we prepared over 25,000 estate plans. So I, I think we have a good handle on the types of mistakes people make and how to avoid them. So I think this will be a good litmus test for you to see where you stand, maybe what issues you have addressed, maybe what needs a little bit of work so you can get to where you want to go, which is to have all your bases covered in case something happens. And by, by the time we're done, and you know, maybe a half an hour or so, maybe a little longer, I think you'll have a very good idea of where you stand and what, if anything, you need to do. So, so let's get started. And, and one last uh, housekeeping item, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A. So while I can't take questions on an ongoing basis, because you know we tend to get lost, uh, uh, lose our train of thought, if you type in your question, we'll answer all the questions at the end, and I hope you'll stay for a lively question and answer. Um, you know, we have offices, five offices across the island, and I think you'll see them in the, uh, the next slide. So let me go to my uh, share screen, and uh, I will share the screen, uh, the five steps to an elder law estate plan, and uh, we have, we're actually a statewide firm from Albany down through the Hudson Valley, Westchester, Rockland, New York, but uh, we're strongest on Long Island, five offices uh, right across Nassau and Suffolk counties. Again, if you just joined us, you'll see there's a Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Just type in your question. We'll answer all the questions at the end. There's uh, the esteemed, esteemed staff. Uh, as you see in front of you, I'm in the middle. To my left, as you're facing the screen, is my lovely wife and law partner, Suzanne Ettinger. And if you like, you can visit us at our website, trustlaw.com. So let's get going with the five steps to an elder law estate plan. So what are the major issues facing seniors today? Avoiding court proceedings on death, avoiding multiple court proceedings for out of state property. So that if you die with a will and you have a property here in Florida, you have to probate in both states. You wanna avoid the multiple uh, probate problem. Avoiding a state appointed legal guardian in the event of disability. Today, about half of all people will have a period in their lifetime where they can handle their affairs. So this is very important. Avoiding New York estate taxes. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. That's for estates 6 million and over. All your assets, if they exceed 6 million, you're facing a New York estate tax of at least $500,000. We'll talk about how to avoid that. Uh, we're gonna talk about protecting assets from long-term care costs. These are your major issues. And keeping inheritance in the bloodline and protecting what you leave from your children's divorces, lawsuits, and creditors. And just as an overview, I'd like you to keep this one word in mind, control. When you plan your affairs, you're taking back control from the government and from the, the state and from the courts, and you're giving it back to yourselves and your family. So try to keep that in mind. You're taking back control and um, you're creating a, a sense of order out of chaos in, in your life, in your future, your family. So of the five steps, the first one, and, and unfortunately, many lawyers miss this because we're not trained to be social workers, but estate planning is social work. Life is social work. Uh, everything has a big social work component. So if you're going to do a good estate plan, you have to understand the family. What are the family dynamics? Are there children? Well, of course. And what's your relationship with them? And also, what are, let's, let's, let's go back. Not only what's your relationship with them, what's their relationship with each other? in terms of settling the estate, in terms of, of uh, not having a, a contest, uh, not having uh, uh, an estate plan that poisons relationships so they don't talk to each other uh, again. Uh, are some of them, uh, do they have disabilities or drawbacks that affect uh, their ability to handle money? We're gonna cover all that, but you can start to see all the issues and how they impinge on estate planning. Uh, are they married? Now, how do you feel about their spouses? You might. Be good with your son, but not with your daughter-in-law and vice versa. That's important. Uh, and not only that, but how are they with their spouses? Um, 
let me go back, I'm sorry, going too fast. Uh, um, for example, do you have a daughter whose, son, uh, whose husband bosses her? So that we have to know that so that we know to protect her from him taking all the money and putting in his name, that sort of thing. Do they have children? Um, and do, let's say your son is married, does his wife have children from previous marriage? Or your daughter's married, does her husband have children from previous marriage? We wanna make sure that your asses get to your bloodline, your grandchildren, and not in-laws grandchildren. Or, uh, you know, they're not grandchildren, they're in-laws children. They're not actually related to you, they're step-grandchildren, but legally there's no relation. What kind of work do they do? Why do we wanna know that? Well. If somebody's an EMT, for example, they might be a good person to make medical decisions, they have medical training. Somebody's in the finance area, they might be better to handle legal and financial affairs. So that helps us develop who should handle which functions when the time comes. Where do they live? I mean, somebody might be very capable, but they live in Seattle. Uh, probably not a good idea to pick them to make medical decisions, that sort of thing. So, um, you can start to see, now this is just a flavor. Obviously we could spend an hour just on, on family dynamics, but I just wanna raise the issue. You know, we like to sit down with a client and we'll spend the first, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. And, and sometimes it could be an hour or two hours, you know, depending on the, the difficulties, but hopefully within, you know, a, about a half an hour, we have a good idea of what your family is like. And we answer all these questions and we develop. Sometimes it takes longer because people have, more complex problems, but I just want to raise the issue tonight so that you, you know, you can start thinking about it and you understand that the first thing to do is the social work. So you get to know the family dynamics. Now, we want to look at what you have in the first place. So do you have a will, a trust, power of attorney, health proxy? Let's look at those, see, are they legally adequate? And many times they're not because they're obsolete or the attorney didn't have the necessary expertise to do it. Um, and then does it address your situation personally? Is the executor you had 10 years ago the same executor you want now? Is the distribution correct? Are these the people you want to get? Is these the percentages you want to get it? Are these the people you want to make medical decisions, first and second choices? So as I said, are the documents legally sufficient? Do they reflect your current wishes? Are you a US citizen that impinges on estate planning? Do you expect to receive an inheritance? Um, good question to ask. Some people uh, are looking at a uh, very substantial inheritance, which will change the plan that we would create for them. Do you have long-term care insurance? And long-term care ins insurance alone is not enough. Uh, how much do you have? What's the daily benefit? How long will it last? And now we look at your long-term care insurance we look at your income and we look at, is that enough to pay for the cost of care or, or are you short? Now, if you're short, how much are you short? And are you willing to uh, pay for the amount that you're short or do you wanna shelter your assets and attempt to qualify for Medicaid for that benefit? For example, I was talking to a client today, her income was $150,000 a year. The cost of care is about 200,000 a year. So I told her, well, are you willing to foot the bill for the extra 50,000 a year you're short, or do you wanna protect your assets and um, perhaps qualify for Medicaid for that extra 50,000? And she said, no, I think uh, I'm close enough. I'll foot the bill if I'm short and, and, and that's perfectly fine. So uh, just looking back at step two, we're reviewing the plan, the existing plan, and the existing planning documents and seeing what can we save if anything. Step three is to review the client's assets. So now, what are your assets? Um, how are they titled and what is their value? So are we talking real estate? Are we talking LLCs? Uh, where are they? What are the value? Who owns them? Uh, assets, investments, bank accounts, retirement accounts, insurance, annuities. Um, we're not too concerned with personal property or automobiles generally. Uh, unless you have some very valuable personal effects, uh, you know, a serious art collection or antique collection uh, or, or other collection of, of uh, very high value, it could be even a car collection. Um, but generally, what are your assets? How are they titled? What is their value? This is crucial. Um, are they qualified? IRA, 401k, uh, 
or are they not qualified, which is everything else? The treatment of IRAs and 401ks is very different in estate planning from non-qualified assets. For example, IRAs and 401ks are exempt from Medicaid. Um, so I don't have to protect those with a, we'll get to later, a Medicaid asset protection trust. Um, they don't go through probate. I don't have to put them in a trust to avoid probate. They have a designated beneficiary. But other assets are exposed to the cost of care. So we're looking at what's how much is qualified, how much is non-qualified. Whose name is it in? Do they have beneficiaries designated? Should we go with beneficiary designations or should we put it in a trust? The putting it in a trust will also protect it from long-term care costs. So we want to consider that. Um, so let's just, uh, um, I want to go back and look at that. So just to finish up step three, review your assets and see how do they fit into the plan. I've seen over the years, many, many clients come in with perfectly valid estate planning documents, but the documents weren't connected to the assets. The assets weren't changed. Each of the beneficiaries of the ownership of the assets weren't changed to reflect the estate plan. So they weren't connected in any way. The estate plan turns out to be just a pile of paper because uh, for whatever reason, uh, no one took the time to coordinate the assets with the estate plan, for example. Let's say you set up trust for your children's inheritance to protect them from divorces and keep it in the blood. Well, then you have to change the IRA beneficiary designations to leave it to those trusts. Otherwise, that money will not be protected from divorces, will not stay in the blood. Um, this is you know, uh, one example. Um, if you want asset protection with a Medicaid asset protection trust, it's only gonna work if you put the assets in. I actually had a client in today we set up the trust uh, three years ago. He came in, you'll see in a little while, we do a three-year review, and he had left 800,000 out of the trust. And we had told him to put it in, but um, and he had a depression mentality. He didn't want to uh, uh, let anything go out of his name. So we have the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, but it's not helping him because he didn't put the assets in. So we convinced him to put, of his 800,000, we convinced him to put uh, uh, 650,000 to the trust leave out 150,000, which was protected because he had a spouse. But again, you know, these things only work if you carry them through and you do what needs to be done. Step four, developing the elder law estate plan. So now we know the family dynamics, we've reviewed the current documents, we know what the assets are, the type of assets, how they're titled. Now we're in a position to develop a plan. What are we gonna do with all this information? Well, first we're going to decide Who's going to make medical decisions for you? You can only pick one person at a time. And the reason for that is if you pick two people and they didn't agree, the doctor wouldn't know what to do. So you can pick one person at a time. Who do you want to handle your legal and financial affairs? Um, so generally, uh, you're going to pick, most people pick one or more adult children. Not everybody has children. Uh, I wrote the book on elder law estate planning. I wrote a chapter on planning for people who don't have children. But generally, um, uh, if you don't have children, you'll pick somebody else. It could be nieces, nephews, uh, close friends, or even your lawyer. So who do you want to handle your legal and financial affairs? Well, you know, it can be more than one person. As I said, you can require them to act together. You can say, I name my son and daughter, and either of them can act. They can act separately. And then we want to look at, do you need a trust or a will? Generally, 60 plus, we're looking at trusts. Uh, estates of six million and more. We're always looking for trusts. Uh, people have property out of state. We're looking at trusts. A lot of reasons to use trusts. Occasionally, we use wills for younger people uh, uh, who uh, may need a trust later on, but don't need it now. But they need something in, in the interim. If it's a trust, it's, is it revocable or irrevocable? Now, revocable and irrevocable trusts have a lot in common. Okay, they both avoid probate at death. They both avoid guardianship proceedings if you become disabled. They both keep your assets in the bloodline. But revocable trusts offer no long-term care protection. They don't protect your assets either from nursing home care, and they don't shelter your assets so you're eligible for home care. Only an irrevocable trust does that. And what's the difference between revocable and irrevocable trust? Well, in a revocable trust, you, the person who created it, you're in charge. You can do whatever you want. If you have a spouse, you're both in charge. Not a problem. 
buy, sell, trade, spend, you do everything yourself, you file the same income tax return, basically the same as you, but it avoids probate, avoids guardianship, keep, keeps assets in the bloodline, and also protects the inheritance you leave from divorce, children's divorces, losses, and creditors. Irrevocable trust does all that, but irrevocable trust does one more thing. It protect your assets from long-term care and nursing home, and also protect your assets so you're eligible for care, care at home, home care aides, Medicaid can send aides to the house to take care of you. The difference is in an irrevocable trust, you can't be the trustee. I said, in a revocable trust, you can be in charge. In an irrevocable trust, if you're in charge and you have to go into a nursing home, they say, well, if you're in charge, take it out and give it to us. If you could get it, they could get it. So starting at 70 or so, people set up this irrevocable trust, they name one or more of the children as trustees, you have to put the kids in charge. You can fire them, you know, you still have some control, but they're the trustees. So only they can get the money because you can't get the money, um, Medicaid can't get it. Um, but you reserve the right to change the trustee at any time. And there's some ways to get money. You can give the money to the kids that can pay your bills if you need some extra money. But in irrevocable trust, you just get the income. So use it for assets you're not gonna spend, like the house you're not gonna spend. You might have a nest egg, maybe four or 500,000, you're not gonna spend like that client I just mentioned. You put in the assets you're not gonna spend, they're there if you need it, but somebody else can come and take it away from you. And next is how do you want the estate to be distributed? It doesn't have to be equal, it could be equal, but it doesn't have to be equal. Maybe some are better off than the others. Maybe some are special needs. Uh, or can handle money or uh, you know, have substance abuse problems. We have to talk about that. Put somebody else in charge of their money, spill it out over a period of years, all kinds of options there. What you need is to know, given your set of circumstances, what do other people do? Why do they do it? What are my options? We want you to know what your options are so you can make an educated choice. You can't make a choice if you don't know what the choices are. So first thing is come in and find out what are my choices? and then you'll be in a much better position to decide. As I say, should it should pay out on debt or should it be spread out in different ways. For example, 20% when I die, half of what's left after five years, the rest after 10 years, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, let's go back. I would like to give this conclude. So now we've developed the estate plan. We have all these decisions made, ask you the questions, you answer them. This usually takes a couple of meetings. And now we have our plan. So where are we going with next five? We're executing and maintaining the plan, which makes perfect sense. So uh, you come into the office. Sometimes we send drafts of clients ask, but generally you come in, we review the documents, trust, inheritance trust for the kids to protect it from their divorces, losses, and creditors, keep it in the blood. Your trust is revocable, irrevocable. Uh, we do the elder law power of attorney, maybe 14 pages, very sophisticated document, all the powers that are needed if you become disabled, health proxy, living will. We get a new will with the trust. It's called a pour over will, P-O-U-R. Uh, because it's a later will, it cancels the earlier will. And the pour over will also says, in case I left something out of my trust, pour it in there after I'm gone because my wishes are written in the trust. Uh, and before I go on, if you just joined us or you, or you joined us after the intro, remember there's a Q&A section, Q&A button on your screen there at the bottom. If you have a question, just type it in and we'll do all the questions at the end. Thank you. Um, as I said, if you want the documents ahead of time, we'll send them. Uh, we, we prefer you wait and go so we can go over it with you, but you have a choice. Um, we're gonna give you instructions on changing the beneficiaries in your IRAs 401ks. Spouse first, generally. And then not the kids second, but those kids inheritance trusts that protect the IRAs from divorces, losses and creditors passed by blood instead of by marriage. Keep it in the, for your grandchildren, not your in-laws and their families. Uh, we publish a law letter, it's called the Ettinger Elder E-Alert, won an award for it. And we send it to you every week and advise you of any law changes or anything else you need to know. Uh, and then a, a good plan is reviewed every three years. We have a system for that, I'll get to all that. Um, so there was a quick, you know, intro uh, into elder law estate planning. Uh, I give a much more detailed one hour, seven, that's about 20 minutes, you know, an overview, but that's what the idea is for the, the club virtual, just have a short meeting, you know, introduce some topics, uh, raise your awareness, uh, and I give you an opportunity to answer questions and, and show you where the, the further resources are if you're interested. 
We have an online seminar. It's every Wednesday at two o'clock. Four reasons why trusts protect you better than wills. That's about a 60 minute seminar, full, you know, full explanation of all the uh, items I raised here and more discussion about revocable trusts, how they work and irrevocable trusts. Uh, you register for that at ettingerplan.com. Wednesdays at two, but if you can't make it, you register anyway, you get the recording. So um, don't worry if you can't make it, you can still watch it at your leisure. Um, and a word about our law firm's unique planning process. Uh, I wrote the book, Elder Law State Planning. It's uh, a bestseller. It published in 2010, 2015, working on the 2020 update. But it's it's pretty much up to date because you can update it you know, uh, anytime you want. So it doesn't need much work. Um, but here's our planning process. You know, It starts with this seminar, um, which is really the one tomorrow, the more detailed one. But we offer a free initial consultation. Um, we review your existing plan, as I mentioned, if you have one. So you bring in your will, trust, power of attorney, health proxy, whatnot. We'll give you a copy of my book, Elder Law State Planning. We'll advise you what chapters apply to your situation. I will tell you, if you decide to go forward with us, this is how much it will cost. It has nothing to do with how much you have. It has to do with what you need, the work you need. It's fixed fee. And, and we set up a second meeting for you to uh, consider our advice and read the chapters that we suggested to you. And, and get your questions answered. So now you come in for that second free consultation. We answer any questions you have. At the second meeting, we draft an estate plan together with you, provide a detailed written proposal for the fees quoted. So remember, we mentioned the fees last time, but now it's in writing, the same fees. And here's a detailed proposal of what we're gonna do for those fees. And then you decide if you wanna go ahead or not. And, and, and uh, this came up today again, you know, we don't have retainer agreement. Um, you don't sign anything, uh, and no fees are due until after the documents are signed. Uh, this way, you know, you're in control. You're always in the driver's seat. You haven't paid anything, and you don't owe us anything until after you sign. So, you know, you're a free agent, and you're in control of the situation. Um, so you come in for that third meeting. Uh, we review all the documents. You're satisfied. You sign them. We sign the deeds to your properties, put them into the trust, show you how to put your other assets into the trust. And uh, you're another happy client of, of Ettinger Law Firm. Um, you can pay by credit card or uh, at once, or you can do it in monthly installments. Uh, but after that, we don't say goodbye, which is the standard is, uh, is thank you very much, goodbye. But we say welcome to the firm. We're starting a relationship. And so we trademark the process uh, for this purpose. And, and the purpose is we want to make sure our plans work when you need them. I hope many decades from now, not when you wrote them, which you know, uh, hopefully you're not going to use it anytime soon. So we keep you up to date of law changes and other matters through our weekly Ettinger Elder Alert. We call it the Alert because it comes by email. We want an award for it, uh, one article a week, something you need to know. Every couple of years, except this year uh, is an exception to say the least. Um, we have a breakfast for our clients, update on the law, what's happening with the firm. We'll uh, invite your next in, meet the lawyers. But the key is this third one. When you have an Ettinger plan, you get a free review every three years. We don't wait for you to call us, we call you. We actually send you a letter, time to come in for your free review. We want to see you, to see if there's any changes in your health, your assets, your family, births, deaths, marriage, divorces, so we know the plan will work and you need it. Uh, we don't charge for phone calls, emails, or questions so the clients can come in and get their questions answered and they get the right answer, uh, which is valuable. Just asking a question doesn't mean you get the right answer. It depends who you're asking. But by using this program, your plan is no more than three years old. It's designed to work when you need it, not when you cited, signed it, I hope, many decades earlier. We have actually saved thousands of people, many thousands of problems with this program. And also, you know, when something bad happens to one of our clients, we know who it is because we have the breakfast every two years and the review every three years. We've seen the average client eight, nine, ten times. So uh, it, it's a good system, I recommend it to you. And I invite you for a free consultation. Um, I say five, a lot of firms charge, we don't charge for it. But if you want a consultation uh, with me or my uh, law partners and wife, Suzanne Ettinger, uh, here on the island, we do most of them. Uh, you could do it in the office, you could do it on Zoom, you could do it by phone. Um, uh, if we get your email address uh, uh, from uh, Club Virtual, we'll send you a link and you can make an appointment. Uh, but even better, 
uh, go to Ettinger Plan, sign up for the seminar tomorrow, get the full seminar, and then you'll see, we'll have your email and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll schedule the consultation. The consultation is free, it's low key, uh, you'll be very comfortable. It goes at your pace and you're always in control. We keep the client in charge. If you want any more information, call my director of client relations, been with us for more than 25 years, can answer any questions you have, Patty Brown at the toll free number on your screen. So there we go. Let's um, let's shrink that and let's go and see uh, if we have any questions. We'll stop the screen share. Uh, we have a few questions. So let's go to the questions. Okay, so Anonymous says, uh, this may seem odd, but my mom's 97 year old partner gave his sons a copy of his will several weeks ago for their request. They don't seem to be very willing to return it in spite of his repeated requests. He'd like to go to my mom's attorney or perhaps to see you to draw up a new will. There are not a lot of assets here, minimal actually, but he does want a will. Could this potentially pose an issue having a new will at age 97? No, well, actually it's not, uh, it's not an issue. Uh, we're, not, um, uh, we're not ageist, you know, we're, we're nine, a lot of people at 97 are perfectly capable of doing a new will. Uh, if he doesn't have any cognitive uh, issues, um, uh, if you want to make sure that will sticks and it's not going to be challenged, get a letter from the doctor uh, saying that he's able to handle his legal and financial affairs. So if somebody challenges the will, say, well, here's the doctor's letter contemporaneous that said he's perfectly fine. And uh, if you have evidence to the contrary, please present it, which they won't have any evidence, so they'll lose. So yes, um, I would say um, he's being taken advantage of. This is a form of elder abuse. I don't condone it. And I think uh, I'd be perfectly happy. I don't think you should go to the mom's attorney because it's gonna look like a conflict. Uh, not that I'm pushing for him to come to see me, but I'm just advising you that uh, it will, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, that, that it will uh, perhaps be better if he goes to a different attorney. You know, I'm happy to do it, but it doesn't have to be me, but mom's attorney is probably not the best idea. So I'm 100% behind you, Anonymous, in, uh, in going to a lawyer, getting a new will, and um, you know he can decide who he wants to leave it to. Uh, Ellen L says, as a follow-up for long-term care, how necessary is it for someone who is healthy and in their 60s? Well, um, that's the time to buy it because it's, it's less expensive. You know, after uh, you know late late 60s or 70s, it's prohibitive. Uh, so you have to buy it in your in your you know maybe 65 or earlier is the sweet spot between 60 and 65 for long-term care insurance. So. If you're buying long-term care insurance, now is the time to do it. If you're not buying it, then starting around 70, you'll set up an irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Tom M says, what is the best way for me to transfer business to my kids after my passing without them having to take on any debt that the business may take on? Well, um, it's hard to answer that question because there's so much I don't know. Uh, I would like you to come in and see me no obligation, of course. But let's talk about the business. You say my kids, you know, they're not all the same to kids. Maybe you want to give different percentages. Maybe some are in the business, some aren't. How are you going to compensate the others? There's a lot to talk about. And, and I'll confess, I don't completely understand your question without them having to take on any debt that the business may take on. Well, you know, the business takes on the debt and they don't give personal guarantees and only the business is liable, uh, assuming it's incorporated or it's an LLC. So uh, I'd love to talk to you about that, Tom. I hope you can come and see us, uh, you know, Lake Success, Melville, Rockville Center, Bohemia, and Huntington Village. Josh, Josh, Josh S., what is the best way for me to plan out my future will for future gains of assets after my death? Well, again, you know, that's, it's a little bit vague. Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, you think you might have, uh, you know, a, uh, an oil well uh, spring up. I don't, I'm not sure what you're getting at. Um, remember, Josh, we review the plan every three years. So if, if, if assets come in, we can adjust the plan. And that's one of the reasons we do review it every three years because people assets change. Maybe you come into a large, uh, large amount. Uh, I'm not sure what you're getting at. Maybe you're investing in business that might come a cropper. So we'll talk about those issues again, uh, if and when you get a chance to see us. So um, I wanna thank you for coming and, and thank you for, um, uh, joining us here in um, uh, Club Virtual. Uh, 
And um, I'm going to uh, leave it at that and uh, hope you join us next, next week. Um, I'll be back in two weeks uh, doing another topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about Medicaid asset protection strategies uh, over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about um, uh, uh, some specialized topics in estate planning, like second marriage planning, uh, planning for uh, people who have children who can't handle money, planning for people who don't have children. So every couple of weeks I'll be on and I hope you'll continue to join me. And uh, if you can, go to ettingerplan.com and join me tomorrow at two o'clock for the full seminar. So let me wish you the best, stay safe, and uh, hope to see you all very soon. Thank you and have a good week.